If you have any questions that come up during this presentation, we encourage you to put them in the chat and to share them with uh, our moderator and try to address who they're to. So at the end, when we reach a Q&A session, um, we'll be able to have that conversation with the presenters themselves to have them answer you. So October is lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer plus, or as I'm sure many of you have heard it, LGBTQ plus history month. We take this time to come together to remember, celebrate how far we've come and use that history to light our path on an even better future. LGBTQ plus history month was actually started in 1994 by Rodney Wilson, a Missouri high school teacher who saw that history education completely ignored the importance of LGBTQ people and erased their lives and experiences. Only four states currently require the teaching of contributions of LGBTQ individuals, California, Colorado, New Jersey, and Illinois. Just a few years ago, it was only required in California. We also chose to hold this event in October because in, uh, it's the month in which we celebrate National Coming Out Day, which was on the 11th. On National Coming Out Day, we honor those in our community who live out and proud and are walking advocates for LGBTQ dignity. We also remember those who face down violence and even death in order to come out, those who never got the chance to come out, and those who are unable to come out for fear about their relationships, their jobs, and their safety. Uh, we currently have a kudos board up with, their, with coming out stories that CSN staff, including myself, have shared, and I encourage you to go and read them. So as for the title of our panel today is In a Moment of Danger, which is a phrase used by historian Walter Benjamin to describe the necessity of history for the survival of people here in the present and moving forward into the future. History is made as we reach for it. It is necessary to retell our stories as a way to ensure our existence into that future, despite a world that is often hostile to our very being. Our presentations today all seek some answers to this question. What memories would LGBTQ people and our allies do well to seize as we work our way through this current moment of danger? So we have four presenters today and followed by that Q&A at the end. I'm going to start off with Jennifer Basquiat, pronouns she, her, hers. Jennifer has a master's in cultural studies from Claremont Graduate School, a master's in communication studies from California State Los Angeles, and a PhD from Claremont Graduate School in Cultural Studies. She has spent 21 years teaching here at CSN in anthropology and communication. As a longstanding member of QICC, she delivers CSN Safe Zone training to faculty and staff and has served as co-chair of the Human Library, which is an engaging look into people's living stories that is definitely worth checking out. Uh, she is currently conducting fieldwork among uh, polygamous communities in the Southern Utah and Northern Arizona. So if you wanna take it away. I will, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, it is absolutely my pleasure to be here today. Uh, I've entitled my presentation, The Reality of Gender Fluidity, Denial as a Moment of Danger, because the real danger where we sit now is this growing movement among some conservative groups to imply that a gender fluidity or the spectrum of human sexuality is something new, that uh, Generation Z has all these crazy ideas and they're um, creating new things that have never been. And, and that's the real danger, to imply that this is a new phenomenon. Next slide. Transgender humans represent the complexity and diversity that are fundamental features of life, evolution, and nature itself. That is a fact. So we're not talking about what all of the individual categories are. We're not talking about um, the broad uh, spectrum and saying that everything can be quantified and understood. We're simply saying that variety and diversity and having a spectrum is scientific fact, despite um, a growing and, and somewhat louder movement to proclaim otherwise. Next slide. A word before uh, moving forward, and this is important because the language that we're bound to simply because of our dominant culture pigeonholes us in ways that, that are really uh, in opposition to what we're trying to do here today. Um, they really are founded on uh, the belief that there are only two sexes, male and female, that there are only two sexualities, gay and straight, and that there are only two genders, man, woman, or masculine and feminine. And so when we say words like transgender or gay, and, and it sounds like it's, it's a new part of the lexicon, it really isn't. It's uh, based on... Um, a faulty assumption that there is in fact a binary that reaches across human experience. Hundreds of distinct societies around the world uh, have long 
revered, respected, understood, and identified multiple genders, third, fourth, fifth, um, even more genders than uh, the binary two that we're used to here. Next. What you see here is a cross-cultural representation. This is by no means a definitive map. Um, what you're looking at now is not interactive, but um, at the end of, of my slideshow, and certainly available to anyone who lets me know, uh, I have a link to that interactive map. And you literally click on any one of those little dots. And it's not just one example, but multiple examples of multiple uh, gender representation cross-culturally. This is definitely not a new phenomenon. Next. Some of the uh, multiple genders or appreciation of the history of uh, understanding and revering multi-gender people uh, that most people are probably familiar with are the idea of the two-spirit people of North America. And this is something that, that crosses across large swaths of uh, Native American uh, history and communities. Uh, perhaps the most uh, famous or the, the most well-known is among the Navajo. Uh, simply two spirit, and that is used as a catch-all uh, for uh, female male, male female in uh, Native American cultures. There's um, an excellent documentary simply entitled Two Spirits that chronicles the story of uh, Fred Martinez, who was murdered in Colorado uh, simply because of his gender and sexual identity. And he was not a boy who wanted to be a girl. I think that as we know more and more about gender uh, identity, we're moving away from this idea of trapped in the wrong body or wanting to be something else. It's not that he was a boy who wanted to be a girl. He was both a boy and a girl, and however he felt like expressing himself along those uh, two points. This was something that his Navajo culture, and in particular his mother, both respected and revered. Male females in this ideology um, typically marry women, while female males marry men. Uh, many of us consider this um, behavior to be homosexual, but Native American ideology and belief uh, does not. Uh, however, when Spanish colonists first arrived in the Americas, that's how it was identified, which led to a tremendous amount of discrimination among that group. Next. Another example of uh, gender fluidity in different cultures is among the um, Buji group, of uh, Indonesia. Um, the Boo guys really take a look at um, a variety of genders. They identify five separate genders um, identified as manly men, womanly women, uh, womanly men, manly women, and then what they identify as Bisu, which is half male and half female. There are two ways in this cultural identity to um, identify as a Bisu. One is to have both male and female reproductive organs. But more importantly, is not just the biological markers that we think determine gender, it's whether or not you were determined to have the soul of the gender that you identify with and the gender that you are. And so it is uh, a woman believed to have the soul of a man is considered to be a basu and vice versa. Next. And finally, as just an example, we have the Hidra of India. And again, these are um, a, an absolutely recognized separate category of gender that disrupts the binary. Uh, typically and historically, hydra are men who consider themselves to be women. Um, they behave like women, use makeup, and wear female clothes. Hydra is also understood to be um, a, an absolutely different classification and is recognized as a third gender. But many of the hydra don't like this, and they would prefer just to be seen as women. Hydra have long been recognized in India uh, for thousands of years. They are mentioned in sacred Hindu writing. And again, as is hardly surprising, um, when British colonists um, found out about this, they were deeply troubled and they criminalized that existence in uh, 1897. Next slide. Part of the reason we see such a doubling down on the gender binary and the sexual identification binary is because of religion. The Western binary is tied absolutely to colonial rule and specifically to Christianity. Uh, this is a quote that's taken from a recent publication by the Vatican that acceptance of flexible ideas of gender poses a threat to traditional families and ignores the natural differences between men and women. Next. 
calls, and this is again from that same uh, Vatican report, calls for a public recognition of the right to choose one's gender and of a plurality of new types of unions in direct contradiction of the model of marriage as being between one man and one woman, which is portrayed as a vestige of patriarchal societies. So what's happening here is the Vatican is, is not only saying, okay, we don't want multiple genders, they're casting multiple genders as a choice rather than um, a, a by design, rather than simply who people are. And when you connect the idea of a binary to religion, you're also connecting people's individual salvation for those who identify as religious or as Christian. Next slide. When we imply that it's a choice, it becomes um, problematic. And it is absolutely a vestige, and, and I would say it's, it's more than just a vestige of patriarchal societies. It is uh, how things are portrayed. And even in my lifetime, things have drastically changed between how we identify um, male and female. The image that you see on the left uh, is a, a advertisement in a magazine for Lego in the 1970s. And if you look at the Legos themselves, they're all primary colors. They're all just different shapes and you can really create and put together whatever it is that, that you want, um, regardless of, of gender. Uh, the representation of both um, what are commonly understood to be boys and girls in that photo are also not specifically tied to gender performance. What you see on the right, however, is how Lego is portrayed now. That if you're a girl and you want to play with Legos, that's fine, but we're going to give you what are seen to be feminine colors. We're going to create castles and princesses. Whereas if you identify or you are seen as a boy by society, then we have primary colors for you. We have construction vehicles. We have different ways of, of imagining who you are, what the world is, and what your place is uh, within it. And this has gone beyond just toy representation. I was born in 1970, so I remember this and I remember seeing um, so much of the changes. If you walk down any supermarket aisle right now, you will see that there is an entire section of soap just for boys, just for men, that is in black, very manly containers. And soap that is marketed to women is much more floral and pretty and soft. And this didn't really used to be this way, even in my lifetime. It was just soap, and some had fragrance and some didn't. And so we tend to be doubling down more and more on this gender binary, and it has disastrous effects. Next. Reliance on the gender binary is causing a tremendous amount of harm. Uh, trans people are facing unique stressors. They are um, experiencing um, tremendous uh, discord when their gender identity is not affirmed, particularly by those that they trust or, or family that they love. Uh, they experience higher rates of discrimination and perhaps even more heartbreaking is they're at a greater risk of suicide, even amongst their LGB uh, counterparts when they don't um, have that gender identity affirmed. Next slide. Despite these disastrous effects, we see a growing and increased voice for uh, the argument that sex is binary. Uh, what you see here is a photo of John Caldara. He is president of the libertarian think tank, the Independence Institute. He recently wrote in an op-ed that sex is binary is not a belief, okay? nor is it an opinion. It is a fact that sex is binary, as Orwell might suggest, as plain as in front of one's nose. It's absolutely the way things are. And this is not, in fact, um, how growing scientific research or people are seeing it. Um, and even though we hear this doubling down and we see this doubling down, it is worthy to note that uh, Caldera was fired from his, his uh, position as uh, a writer uh, by the Denver Post, I believe, uh, specifically because of this comment. So things are moving in the right direction. Next slide. Even as dominant culture doubles down and tries to reform and, and sort of will into being that uh, sex and gender are binary, we do see some growing um, cause for optimism across the globe. Uh, in May, the World Health Organization officially approved a resolution to remove gender identity disorder from its global diagnostic uh, manual. 
Uh, a majority of Americans have heard about the use of uh, gender neutral pronouns and about one in five say they personally know someone who uses them. Roughly half of the Americans say they would be somewhat or very comfortable using a gender neutral pronoun to refer to someone. And in 2019, at least seven states had started offering a third gender option. Um, many more so have done so in 2020 with either completion or plans to uh, add that third category. Next. So as we move forward, the celebration and understanding and respect of uh, trans identity and gender fluidity is absolutely growing. Next slide. What you see here is a response from a New York Times uh, survey where 5,000 people responded, asking them to talk about the words they use when discussing uh, their own gender identity, gender fluidity, or the idea of sexual identity as well. And then these words were broken down into generational categories so that you see what language was uh, more popular with uh, baby boomers, Generation X, Millennials, and Generation Z. And what's most interesting to me here is that most of this language appears on every list. There are a few that have gladly fallen out of favor, but most of, of these words are in use and have been in use, which again is a direct contradiction to this idea that gender fluidity is a, a new thing. It uh, has been and always will be. Next. The human experience is infinite. This is something that is not dangerous. This is something that is not um, causing problem for our society. The human experience is infinite and the real danger is in denying this reality. Thank you. And then as I mentioned, there are a couple slides of work cited. Uh, you won't be able to, to sort of do that now, but if anybody uh, emails or lets the group know, um, I'm happy to send that to you. Those are some interactive links that will allow you to uh, have access to some of the resources that I talked about today. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, that was fantastic. Uh, and then now we're going to move on to Adam Burgess, whose uh, pronouns are he, him, his right there. Adam has a master's from California State University, Long Beach, and a PhD in English from Northern Illinois University. He's been teaching at CSN since 2017 prior to which he taught for five years at Northern Illinois University and Elgin Community College. Adam also holds a graduate certificate in LGBT studies and teaches courses in diverse and inclusive literature, including queer literature and Southeast Asian literature. Thanks so much, everybody. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, title of my presentation here is who we are is where we've been. Um, and I'm supporting uh, Dr. Basquiat's presentation a little bit in agreeing that part of the problem um, for LGBTQ people is that our stories and our identities and the histories of those stories are time and time again um, either ignored or actively erased. And so we're trapped in this perpetual uh, conversation of having to reassert that we exist in the first place when the truth is that we've been here all along. Um, so in my presentation here, I want to go through a little journey about why uh, stories and the history of stories matter. Um, talk a little bit about my path uh, in finding identity and community uh, through stories. And then some uh, examples of research that I've been doing about how um, and where these stories are being told. After that, I'll continue to discuss um, some examples of lasting stories, stories that many of us know, that we've known since, since childbirth, that our, our parents and grandparents probably known, um, with some ideas about how we can um, use that to remember, to tell, and uh, um, activate uh, LGBTQ stories as well. And then I'll provide some examples of, of some great stories that exist uh, that people are not really aware of and end with a little activist uh, vision that I have. Next slide, please. So uh, the quote here I have from Cicero is um, reinforcing the idea that who, who are we if we don't know 
where we've been and where we come from. Um, the human experience is really communicated through stories and it always has been. We have found, or researchers and scientists and anthropologists have found cave paintings dating back 44,000 years uh, in areas of France and in Indonesia. Uh, and since that time, every human society and culture has been communicating through story in some fashion, whether it's cave painting, written language, um, cinema, podcasting, Snapchatting, uh, whatever the case may be. I, I, the closer and closer we come to contemporary times, the more options we've had for telling these stories. But the one universal is we have always tried to connect uh, with ourselves and with each other by sharing stories about ourselves, about our desires, about our fears. Um, and so if we think about that long history, and where we are now, uh, as far as LGBTQ stories and, and representation, we might rightly ask, well, haven't we come really far? <laughs> Shouldn't we be celebrating the fact that, oh, we've got television shows and songs and artists and um, uh, popular figures that are out and proud and sharing their stories. And that is a great thing. But the danger is in how easy it is for those stories to be erased and for those stories to be silenced because they are the stories of a marginalized um, people. So think about, for example, in 2017, um, after uh, the Trump administration took over, right? Uh, one of the very first things that they did was to remove any reference to LGBTQ people uh, across their divisions on their websites online, right? Um, to try and institute a transgender ban on serving in the military, to remove the question about LGBTQ representation from the census, right, which is um, something that would provide recognition of LGBTQ existence in every community in the United States for the next 10 years uh, is no longer there. And so when governments and um, pop cultures and other um, authorities of the dominant culture start to decide that minority cultures representation doesn't matter, that those stories don't get to exist, uh, it becomes very easy for those stories to fall out of the, the lexicon and to fall out of the zeitgeist and to no longer um, exist uh, in any meaningful way. And the same is true, we know, from any marginalized uh, experience in the United States, right? If you think about your experience with uh, history in the U.S., how, how much do you know about exploitation of the Irish? How much do you know about uh, indentured servitude for, for Chinese individuals? How many of you heard of June 13th for the very first time this year, right? Or uh, maybe just heard about it today when I, when I said the word. Um, indigenous stories, things like that. Um, so in thinking about our experiences with what we know about history and the stories that have been told from people who are not like us, a question to ask is, which stories have been elevated um, by the dominant culture and which stories have fallen out of the conversation and how do we reclaim those? We need to be very careful to remember our stories, to find them, to repurpose them, to put them back into the conversation um, so that we're not always constantly and perpetually fighting um, for our current existence. The more history that we have, the more it is in conversation at any given time, um, the more real it becomes. Next slide, please. So a little bit about um, my experience and what brought me here and got me interested in exploring LGBTQ stories um, was, of course, my own personal experience as a, a gay man. Um, and so, you know, in, in, in coming of age and, and coming out, I remember looking around and and wondering um, where where the other gay stories were and where the other gay people were and um, in my time I had some examples like uh, Ellen DeGeneres and Elton John and uh, and, and Boy George right um, but in common conversation in, in everyday conversations it was not something that was discussed we know that it was it was taboo taboo even dangerous um, to bring in up uh, these basic life stories of LGBTQ people who exist in, in society. So 
what do you do, you know, when you're a kid uh, in the early 90s and trying to figure out things? You go to the library. And that's where I first started to find these other stories that did exist and that had been told. Um, in the first two books, I can remember by name, books titled Intel Cotton and Dream Boy, um, I found, you know, discreetly on the library shelves at my public library. And I would reserve my time in the private study space in the library to read those books and then put them back on the the shelf because I didn't dare check them out from the library. That would be on my permanent record, right? Uh, and it's there that I started to appreciate that that literature, that storytelling. Uh, there was an answer there, right? There was a conversation that was happening across time and across space, just as there is with any other community that exists and is trying to share their stories with one another and with uh, the larger populations. And so from there, I went on to study uh, English in college and I had my first experience with, uh, in my junior year of college, an out um, lesbian professor who was very open, not just about the facts of who she was and her identity, uh, but other writers that have existed for hundreds of years who have been sharing their stories too. And things started to click for me that those two books I found as a junior high student in the library um, were not, were not one-offs. Right? that they were part of a much larger conversation that for some reason uh, the dominant culture had decided wasn't really worth exploring, <laughs> didn't really belong in general uh, conversation. And as a college student, I began to really wonder why and how could we change that? And that's what took me off to graduate school. Um, and in my master's degree in the first place, I started to explore some specific authors and go into depth with their works. And that took me into my second phase in the PhD program, where uh, I ended up doing my dissertation on the many, many, many voices um, of uh, gay voices in America that existed uh, before we realized it, right? And that were publishing, publishing their books and their stories openly uh, in a time that we wouldn't have expected that to have been possible. Um, but of course, their stories all disappeared, right? So that leads me to what did I start to do uh, to reclaim those stories? Next slide, please. So uh, recently I, uh, I did some research on uh, the publishing triangles, 100 best pieces of, of lesbian gay literature and compared that to um, academic representation of LGBTQ uh, literature in coursework. So I took uh, a look at 20 syllabi from gay and lesbian literature courses uh, across the United States uh, between 2005 and 2015 and started to look at the breakdown of whose stories are being told. Um, and I even broke it down into um, sex, for example. And something interesting happened. You can see at the top there of the 100 best pieces of lesbian and gay literature, 93%, 93 out of those 100 were published 1950 or uh, more recently than that. That's not a whole lot of history, right? If they're saying that 93% of the good gay culture has only been existence uh, since 1950, uh, that's a warning flag to me, or since 1900, sorry. So I thought, well, what are we teaching? Uh, is pop, uh, pop reading, pop literature, the same representation as what's, what's happening? Um, in academia. And uh, well, yes and no. <laughs> On some level, when we get into academia, it gets a little bit better and what's actually being studied and taught. And so we can see that 88% uh, of texts in higher education that are be taught, being taught in the LGBT fields are from 1900, as opposed to 93%. So there's some progress there. There's a little bit more representation from earlier times. But if you look closer at um, the the long term history, we move completely away from anything published prior to 1800. And I think part of that is because it wasn't until the late 1800s that the term homosexuality was coined and understood as a concept, right? This idea of what it means to identify as a person with same sex attraction, um, same sex romantic interests, and the possibility of living a life romantically uh, with someone of the same sex. It just wasn't uh, understood prior to the to the late uh, 1800s and the work that the sexologists were doing at that time to understand it. 
Um, and so in some, some way, this is understandable, right? Why academics wouldn't be teaching texts that are older than that as gay texts. On the other hand, there are texts that represent same-sex love and attraction that are much older than 1900, right? That have been around for much longer. And those stories that exist with women loving women and men loving men um, and gender diverse peoples. And so whether or not we decide to call that homosexual or not after the fact isn't so much the point as that we need to know those stories and that those attractions and that those individuals existed um, for as long as human identity has existed, whether or not we have the same term um, to refer to it or not. Next slide, please. And so what's lit got to do with it? So what can we do with literature? Um, I have a, a story I like to share about nursery rhymes and song. Uh, and I think often about that song, Ring Around the Rosy, and how almost everybody I've ever met knows this song. Doesn't matter how old they are, right? Ring Around the Rosy, a pocket full of posies, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. We learned it as kids, our parents learned it as kids. We probably teach our kids it uh, right now. And the interesting thing is, the, the English language version of that song was published in Mother Goose in 1881. Um, but it actually comes from a 1796 German text. So this is a, a nursery rhyme, a song that has been around for a very long time and is still in the popular conversation. And for kids, it's a fun little song, right? We learn, uh, we learn language through stories. We learn memory, uh, memorization techniques through rhyme. And as a kid, when you hear that ashes, ashes all fall down and you fall down onto the floor and you're giggling and laughing and it's a lot of fun, but when you hear it again as an adult and you really listen to the words, you hear that line, ashes, ashes, we all fall down a little bit differently, right? Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. What in the world are they talking about? It sounds like nuclear warfare, right? Uh, and so it does date back all the way to 1665. It's a story about the Black Death. And so here we have this very old story, 400 year old story, told again 200 years later, in Germany, and another 100 years later, translated into English. And here we are in 2020, and we still know the rhyme, and we're still teaching this rhyme. And this story, this little, this little um, rhyme song continues to persist. And that's the power of storytelling. That's the power of getting a story into the com common conversation um, to help us remember certain historical things and events that happened. So we can do that for LGBTQ people, right, in a similar way. I've got some other examples of um, very, very old stories that are still in common conversation. And in contrast to some stories very old, right, with queer representation, LGBTQ representation, that um, are not so often taught, right? At, at least if you're not outside of uh, the the college, the higher education sphere, but we can go all the way back to um, five six hundred BC to find women loving women in poetry of Sappho. We can go back to uh, gender and sexuality representation in Lysistrata and uh, four hundred years BCE. We can go back to Plato's Symposium to see him musing on same sex attraction in different ways. And we can go back to Chaucer's Canterbury Tale and find a character, the partner, who is literally described as um, uh, what we would today call homosexual. Uh, so if we look at these stories that have been in existence for a very long time, the question is, how do we persist with those stories? Uh, and how do we consciously get those stories into the popular um, lexicon and conversation so that they stay? One example is what we what happened with Stonewall. And a lot of people think that that gayness, right, that everything gay started with Stonewall. And there's a reason for that. It's because the people who got involved with Stonewall, the people who got involved with memorializing it, the people who who, who invented the first Pride Parade, right, which was really a march the year after the Stonewall riots happened, they did it intentionally. They did it on purpose because they understood history and how it works. And that if you make an event of it, 
if you turn an event into a moment, and if you turn that moment into a story that is repeated year after year after year, it becomes a part of the conversation and it lasts. So there were riots uh, before Stonewall, right? There were riots in California and San Francisco and in, in Los Angeles. There were riots at the Molly Clubs in England a hundred years before Stonewall. But the one that we remember is Stonewall because someone decided this was important enough to turn into a movement and to turn into a lasting story. And it did change our culture forever. Next slide, please. So I have here uh, just a list, an example of some of that good literature that was happening uh, in the United States, because that's my area of focus. But you'll see um, some examples here from 1903 all the way to 1968. And these are uh, openly gay texts published by openly gay authors um, telling their story. And there's some really interesting examples in here with people that uh, were, were friends of people in positions of power. Uh, for example, that first one there, For the Pleasure of His Company, Charles Warren Stoddard was a wildly popular travel writer. He was good friends with um, William Dean Howells, who was the uh, the editor slash publisher of the, of the time, one of the most powerful men in literature at the time. Good friends with Charles Warren Stoddard. Uh, Stoddard was also good friends with Mark Twain and worked for, for Mark Twain. And so this was a man who was living openly, right, as a man who loved other men, um, and had good friendships with incredib incredibly powerful and popular other writers at that time. Um, and he eventually was able to publish his own uh, gay story as well. He was cautioned, right, if he did it, that it would probably be the end of the, his career. And unfortunately, that turned out to be true. <laughs> it was his last published um, work, but it happened, right? The question is, how do we find and return all of these kinds of narratives that have been dropped out of the popular conversation into the conversation once again? How do we get those stories that have been lost um, to be found again? And some good work, work is starting to happen. Some of these books have received recent um, editions. So A Scarlet Pansy, for example, uh, and Totem Pole, just in the last few years uh, have received some, some um, new publications with forwards. Um, and so it's beginning to happen because we are choosing to remember these stories and to elevate them again. Next slide, please. And so the last thing I'll say is, say is uh, one of the things that we have to do if uh, we are going to ensure our place, right, as LGBTQ people or, or as allies um, is that we need to be advocates for stories, right? Get these stories into schools, support, advocate for LGBTQ education uh, in our public schools, tell and receive stories with others, right? And share them um, and, and let young people know that these stories exist um, and give them more than just the token celebrity to look at, but make it a part of the common conversation. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Adam. Appreciate it. And uh, it's a nice talk on advocacy and just what we've lost. It's it's really remarkable. Um, <clears throat> next up, we've got Joe Hassert, pronouns he, him, his. Joe has a PhD in communication studies from Southern Illinois University. He spent 14 years teaching communication at Southern Illinois, Bloomsburg University of Pennsylvania, and at CSN. His past research focused on the communication and performance of gender and sexuality with a specific focus on the construction of bisexual identity. As the co-chair of QICC, Joe tends to be a driving force in uh, almost everything we do as a group. And give it to you, Joe. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> so what histories made this picture of me uh, possible? an out bisexual in a rainbow suit at last year's Las Vegas Pride. What happened to make this pride I'm feeling possible? Eric Cervini's 2020 book, The Deviants War, The Homosexual versus the United States, offers some answers to these questions. Cervini's Deviants War is a major contribution to LGBTQ history and it offers lessons to those of us continuing the work detailed in its pages. 
Today, I'll give a review of Deviant's War, um, tell you a little bit about its story, the people who live in its pages, the events that they lived, and finally, some of the lessons that I learned and that I'm taking with me in this moment of danger. Uh, next slide, please. Reviews from queer historians are positive. Charles uh, Kaiser in The Post calls Eric Servini's book brilliant and says it's the first full length biography of Frank Kameny, who Kaiser calls the intellectual father of gay liberation. Though um, the book doesn't break new ground, he says, it is a good primer for any student of queer history. Um, while other books also cover the emergence of the gay movement, Servini's Deviant's War offers us an allegory of this history told through the life of a man named Frank Kameny, one of the most influential gay activists in history. Next slide, please. Allegories have deeper lessons hidden within them. So when I say that this story, this history is an allegory, I mean that through a biography of Frank Kameny's life pictured here, Servini tells a larger story about queer political life in the 20th century. Deviant's War is a story of how queer people fought subjugation by science as deviants and the state as criminals in order to become subjects of our own story. In short, it's the story of how we as a people and as a society have started to understand that gay is good. Kameny was born in 1925, toward the end of a period of expanding sexual freedoms, yet gay, as Adam mentioned, as a political identity, didn't quite exist. Uh, there was no gay pride um, in 1925. Uh, up until the gay movement of the early 70s, psychologists asserted with more and more authority that, the hom that homosexuality was an illness, and the state asserted with more and more force that it was criminal. Kameny was brilliant and, and he knew it. Uh, he decided at four years old that he was going to be a scientist and he knew at a very early age and accepted his sexuality uh, internally, uh, even though he knew um, society might reject him. If it rejected him, he thought, let it. Um, after fighting in World War II, Kameny pursued an education and quickly became a promising astronomer. With the launching of Russia's Sputnik rocket, Servini says that astronomers became among the country's most important citizens overnight. And Kameny was an early recruit of the U.S. space program in 1957, and soon after that, he was fired fired for being a suspected homosexual. You see, years earlier, Kameny um, was arrested for lewdness after officers hiding in the ventilation shaft of a, of a men's room uh, saw another man touch Kameny in what we might call a, a cruising or a tea room situation. Now, Homosexuals, mostly men, engaged in such activity because at the time, public restrooms and parks were often the safest places for gay men to meet. Participants would take measures to protect themselves and bystanders from harm. And these were consensual encounters and victimless crimes in a repressive time, you know, well before hookup apps and National Coming Out Day. So Kameny, was fired from his government job uh, for a misdemeanor, uh, but his larger was that he was gay. Uh, he was a victim of the anti-communist panic of the 50s as authorities declared homosexuals security risks in what we now call the Lavender Scare. Kameny was robbed of his life's work and his struggle began. Kameny lost and lost and, and lost up to the Supreme Court where he lost. Yeah. Uh, so he was robbed of his life's work and he would never work for our government again. Um, he would never work as an astronomer again. 
Instead, his life became a, a fight for liberation. Kameny's legacy is rich, as Servini uh, details in the book. Kameny co-founded the Mattachine Society of Washington, a, a major organization in what was then called the homophile movement. He was the first out person to testify before Congress. He convinced the ACLU to fight for gay rights. Uh, he organized the first protests um, of, for gay rights at the White House. And he was the first out person to run for Congress. Now, Kameny's greatest contribution, Servini asserts, is the unprecedented legal argument that homosexuality is a moral good. And this argument formed the corner, cornerstone of future legal victories. Kameny made the case boldly. We assert flatly, without compromise, that homosexuality, whether by act or inclination, is not immoral. And in fact, for those inclined, it is immoral in a positive sense. So the, this argument that gay is good catalyzed a, a revolution in our consciousness. Kameny is the hero of Deviant's War, but Servini evokes many other important people that we should also remember. Next slide, please. Two groups are really central to Servini's telling of pre, the pre-Stonewall homophile movement. The Mattachine Society of Washington, which was co-founded by Kameny and Jack Nichols, and a lesbian group, the Daughters of Belitis, founded by Del Martin and Phyllis Leon. Uh, both groups started as very small, uh, holding secretive meetings because they were, they were scared about losing their jobs and their housing uh, if they were exposed. Kameny and the MSW, uh, moved the homophile movement toward a more out and activist um, and even militant stance over the years. Still, uh, MSW was at the time and even now uh, criticized for its politics of respectability, um, its efforts to assimilate uh, into mainstream heteroculture, yet despite its attempts to be seen as respectable by straight America, Servini reminds us that it was quite often the MSW and Frank Kamini who pushed the homophile movement toward a more confrontational stance. Uh, Barbara Giddings founded the uh, New York chapter of the Daughters of Belitis with her partner, Kay Lehausen, who's pictured here at the bottom. Uh, she was a photojournalist who captured the most iconic moments of the gay liberation. Bayard Rustin, upper middle, um, is a giant of the civil rights struggle and the man who taught Dar Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. nonviolent resistance. He was gay and his peers uh, viewed his sexuality, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> viewed his sexuality uh, as a problem, so uh, he's often forgotten. Now, Rustin was not in the homophile movement, but his ideas and strategies were explicitly adopted uh, by Kameny, and so we should remember Rustin. Uh, none of this would be possible without him. Um, in the early, uh, if, excuse me, if the early movement uh, had a publicist, it would be Randy Wicker, who's pictured in the upper right here, uh, a colorful figure who published uh, a bold gay lifestyle magazine. Uh, and some of the best moments of the book um, are his clashes with the more tight-laced Kameny. Uh, Lily Vincennes was the first lesbian in the MSW, and her work led to the creation of Lambda Legal, a group that would go on to win marriage equality before the Supreme Court. Uh, queer activists and trans women of color, Sylvia Rivera, Yvonne Ritter, and Marsha P. Johnson, uh, I should say Johnson, my apologies, um, play a starring role in an exciting chapter-long retelling of the Stonewall Riot. Uh, next slide, please. The Deviant's War also takes readers on a deep dive into 
many historic events. Uh, under threat, we see the emergence of queer subculture uh, in the shadows of urban life. We see early resistance to the criminalization of queer love in the cooperation and trust required for the Ill illegal intimacy of a public cruise or hookup. Uh, I see the first movements and organization of our political body. Uh, in Deviant's War, we go to early meetings of the Mattachine Society founded by Harry Hay, and we see its struggles with infighting and secrecy, and we see it grow to a national group and then fall apart. We're taken into Congress and inside uh, J. Edgar Hoover's FBI task force to root out homosexuals uh, into what is now called the Panic on the Potomac uh, and the Lavender Scare. We march on Washington and see how black civil rights uh, and, and the black civil rights movement and Bayard, Bayard Rustin directly influenced how Kameny would conduct the first pickets of the White House. We read about the early debates between allies, uh, debates that are similar to ones we're having right now. Uh, where are the lesbians in the, in the movement? Uh, why is this movement so white? When will trans people be given a place at the table? Finally, uh, Cervini uh, di dives really deep into uh, the, sto the celebrated Stonewall riots, uh, where patrons of a New York gay bar fought against police harassment. Uh, one of the highlights for the book, to, for me, uh, Adam mentioned this, were events that took place on the anniversary of Stonewall, the Christopher Street Liberation March, uh, what we now call Pride. Uh, Cervini's descriptions of that joyous day will, will send chills down your spine. Next slide, please. So uh, what can we learn from Cervini's Deviant's War? Next. My, my first lesson is that it, it gets different. Uh, and this is a corrective to the It Gets Better campaign from a few years back. Uh, we've made great progress, but we must remember that things don't always progress. From 1930 to 1969, there was an arms race of state oppression against homosexuals. Uh, and it's just morphed ever since into new manifestations. So things get better, things get worse, societies close, societies open, sometimes at the same time. Um, I think optimism's important, but accuracy is too. And so after reading this book, I have to say, I think it is more accurate to say that things get different. Next slide. Dark matter matters. Um, underground culture like the dark matter in our universe, is what moves things, even if we can't see it. Uh, below the organized political movement, culture emerges from our response to the limits and freedoms of our time. If Kameny hadn't met that stranger in a bathroom, uh, if queer people didn't create their own spaces, would political organization even be possible? So nurture the dark matter, um, nurture the places where happenstance, serendipity, innovation, creation uh, can happen. Next. Third, alliances matter. Gay rights would not be possible without the black civil rights movement, period. Uh, black lives matter, period. Uh, we would not have pride uh, if trans men and women didn't take a stand alongside cisgender men and women. Trans lives matter. Deviant's war shows that alliances are really difficult, um, but they are essential, and so we have to be there for our allies. Uh, next slide. Lesson four, nonviolent does not mean inactive. It does not mean avoiding confrontation. It does not mean uh, to allow, to even uh, follow the law always. Deviant's war uh, shows that we are at our best when we are out uh, and even militant, when we don't avoid conflict. Still, our movement was almost without exception dedicated to the philosophy of nonviolent resistance. 
Nonviolent does not mean inactive. Next slide. Final lesson, lesson five, persistence through queer failure. This is a story of a thousand little failures and just a few successes. The world was stacked against Frank Kameny, and you better believe it's still stacked against us. Through all his struggles, it was his persistence that should be remembered. It was not his charm. He was not charming. Like he goes on and on about how not charming this man was. Um, it wasn't his charm that made him a powerful force. Uh, it was his unwavering belief in his own worth. And I think uh, that's what I'll remember most about it. I'm getting emotional. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I learned those five lessons from uh, this book and uh, I hope that you read it to, to learn some lessons for yourself. Next slide. So Kameny uh, lived long enough to get an apology uh, from the government, but that was really the extent of his compensation. Uh, he's pictured here uh, being recognized by President Obama as Obama is signing protections from, for same-sex partners of federal employees. Uh, this was two years before Kameny uh, passes. And uh, this is where Deviant's War ends. Kameny's, though, his most recent victory um, came after his death. And it actually was just this summer when the Supreme Court finally acknowledged that lesbians, gay, bisexual, transgender Americans are all protected by the Civil Rights Act that was, was passed back in the 1960s. Um, and that makes me particularly proud. Uh, so how did I get here? How am I the proud bisexual that you see before you? Uh, well, Servini's Deviance War offers uh, some explanation of that history. Uh, and uh, though those events are history, uh, our fight continues. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Joe. That was fantastic. You said it was just going to be a book report. I feel like it was so much more than that. <laughs> All right, so moving on to our final panelist, we have Professor Patricia Vasquez, pronouns she, her, hers. Patricia has a master's in comparative literature from Arizona State University, and she has taught literature and composition at CSN for the past 22 years. In 2007, she developed the Queer Literature course, first as a themes in literature class, but then later developing the course catalog number for NSHE, English 272 in 2008. In addition to being a member of the Quick Community or Quick Committee, sorry, she helps facilitate safe zone trainings to develop more inclusive and equitable community on campus. Take it away, Patricia. Uh, thanks. You can skip to the next slide, Robin. I think there might be a, a couple of slides. That was just to remind me what the uh, the gist of the talk was. Uh, means taking control of a memory as it flashes in a moment of danger, and I believe that we are in a moment of danger. And I'll explain in the next slide. Um, Robin. Uh, so uh, one of the things that I have been noticing in uh, gay magazines is saying that, you know, the struggle is basically over. Um, we've become mainstream. We've won all the rights that we've been fighting for. And aside from being an English teacher, I've been uh, active uh, in the queer rights movement uh, my entire life. Uh, so uh, so let me just start by saying that, you know, when I was uh, in school that I was um, threatened by a coworker uh, who, because I was gay, uh, she uh, suggested that it was a hostile working environment and I nearly lost my job. And so things were actually very, very scary uh, when I was going to school. And then when I started working at CSN, uh, sexual orientation wasn't, part, wasn't a protected uh, uh, group. And so I also risked uh, being out and being uh, an activist. But, uh, and so one of the, the, the last, I think things started to really change, uh, I would say, in about 1998. Uh, there was a huge shift in the country. A lot of my students aren't yeah. familiar with Matthew Shepard, but Matthew Shepard was killed in 1998 in a way that was so brutal that even people who were not um, supportive of gay rights it had sympathy and that actually was a huge shift and that occurred in 1998 and so by uh, because of that uh, later on uh, there was uh, and, and let me just say that before the 1998 
uh, Matthew Shepard murder. There was also uh, the murder of a soldier in uh, Japan uh, within the military that caused the don't ask, don't tell uh, law to be implemented in the early 1990s. That was a uh, kind of a hit and miss. Some people felt that it was better. Some people thought it was worse, but it wasn't until 2011 that don't ask and don't tell was repealed. And so let me talk about how that changed. Uh, aside from Matthew Shepard changing things and making people supportive of gay rights, um, there was a huge landmark case. And if, and if you only know five five cases of the Supreme Court, here it is. Oh, uh, is there a documentary on Don't Ask, Don't Tell? Absolutely there is. Oh, isn't there? Yes. Um, there's all sorts of documentaries on Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And that's basically the military saying, you know, if somebody's gay, don't ask, and then don't tell, which was a lot better than before, which was basically, you know, that they would just uh, kick you out. To be honest with you, though, the reality of Don't Ask, Don't Tell was this, was that um, if they knew that you were gay, they would send you to war. And if you came back alive, then they would, you know, uh, kick you out uh, on a dishonorable discharge. And so this was actually uh, happening uh, quite regularly until there was a case that came up, I want to say in 2010. Uh, that, uh, you know, I understand, you know, I, I think I found that far more offensive uh, than just kicking gays out. Uh, this idea that, oh, we're going to let them fight, and if they don't die, then we'll kick them out so that they don't have benefits afterwards. Uh, I thought that was incredibly cruel. But but anyway, one of the, for me, uh, one of the cases that really started to change things around, in 2002, uh, we were fighting here in Nevada uh, to, to stop the ban against marriage, the DOMA. Uh, they were putting it into the Constitution, the defense of marriage, and everybody you know, was saying that, you know, you had to defend the family. And in 2002, they put it into the Nevada Constitution. But things then changed in 2003 with Lawrence versus Texas. The Supreme Court ruled uh, that you couldn't criminalize homosexual behavior because uh, there are straight people that engage in, say, oral and anal sex, and we don't put those people in jail. And so why is it that we're only singling out gay people for engaging in acts that heterosexual people engage in as well? And the person that actually came uh, that, that, that uh, you know, was really in our favor was a conservative judge, Sandra Day O'Connor, who uh, used this, uh, the clause, the 14th Amendment clause. Uh, and, and so that was a huge a uh, huge win. If you guys don't remember the story of Lawrence versus Texas, it was two gay men uh, who were having sex in their the, the privacy of their own homes, not not in a gay bathroom, not anywhere else. And their neighbor, who knew they were gay, called the police to say that these guys had guns. So the police stormed the place and then basically dragged them in their underwear uh, to the police uh, 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 to the police office um, and. Uh, but luckily, though, Lawrence did fight back on that. And so that was a huge um, that was a huge win. Uh, then later on, there was pressure to to repeal the don't ask, don't tell, uh, which had been very unpopular uh, before the military chiefs were completely opposed to it. Their argument was that it was going to damage uh, group morale. Uh, it did none of this. Obviously, they were sending gay people to war. Um, and uh, and not saying anything about it. Uh, so, so the next uh, case that is really important is in 2013, we had the U.S. versus uh, Edie Windsor. And so Edie Windsor was someone who was married to her partner, I want to say something for like maybe even more than half a century. I'm not exactly sure of the number, but it was decades and decades. And her partner fell ill. And before uh, she passed on, she wanted they wanted to get married. And so they 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 went to Canada because in the U.S. The, you couldn't get married. Uh, so uh, but it, not everywhere. There were states that were starting to allow it. I wanted to say, I think uh, I think in Nevada, uh, I was actually married under what was not called marriage. We didn't go to the marriage um, bureau. We actually had to go. Uh, and get a business license. And so we were considered within the law uh, something that was, um, you know, like a, like a business partnership rather than a, than a marriage. 
So uh, what, ha what had happened is that when her partner died, she was expected to pay a huge inheritance tax, something that heterosexual couples are not asked to do. And so they, uh, the ACLU took them to court and ruled that DOMA was basically unconstitutional because, again, it was treating married same-state couples different from the way it treated married uh, couples. Uh, and so that was, a, that was another win. And then, uh, you know, in 2015, uh, we had another win that, that really was, I think, the last time people were really pay, paying attention, and that's uh, Ober, uh, Oberjafel and Hodges. And that's because Oberjafel uh, was, again, married to someone uh, who he was with for a very long time, and his partner, I, I believe, had uh, Lou Gehrig's disease and was passing on. So they decided to get married uh, they couldn't get married in Ohio, so they got married in Maryland and then came back. And that's really all they wanted was just to be recognized as a couple before the law. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons why that happens. It's not only just with, uh, you know, being able to visit your partner in the hospitals, but it's being able to determine, like, what happens to your property after, you know, your partner is dead. So, you know, the, 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 the things that you shared, the home that you shared. And so... Um, this was a, a big case which uh, basically allowed, uh, you know, same-sex couples to be married across the USA. So this was the big, you know, gay marriage win in 2015. Uh, but that wasn't nearly as important as one case that happened uh, as of uh, June uh, of last summer. In uh, 2020, actually the cases were heard in the fall a year ago, and uh, there were three cases and uh, the court just consolidated them. And it was basically trying to determine whether or not the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which forbids workplace discrimination on the basis of race uh, and, and gender, on the basis of sex, does the, on the basis of ex uh, sex, does it extend to LGBTQ people? That was the question. And to be honest with you, that was, that was gonna have a much bigger impact than getting married. You know, if you want to get married, there's, a few, you know, there's going to be a number of people, a few people that want to get married. But all queer people are going to need to work in order to support themselves. And so this had a much larger and lasting impact. And so I was really uh, pleasantly surprised because it was kind of iffy. That, we, that it was actually ruled in our favor. Uh, I listened to all the arguments here. So uh, after this, this is when all the articles in the gay magazines were coming out, you know, is the struggle over? They were basically saying, yes, this is the struggle over. We don't have to worry about things any, anymore. And my argument is that no, the struggle is not over. Uh, as uh, Joe was talking about, things just get different. And right now uh, we're, again, we're about to experience a backlash for all these wins that we have one in the last 20 years. So Robin, if you could uh, get to the next slide. Um, and, and here, uh, I, I was just gonna talk about how, uh, you know, uh, the, the we, we definitely, there is a momentum. I don't wanna like, you know, scare you too much. Uh, as I wanted to say, 30 years ago, most Americans were opposed to LGBTQ rights. As we said, in 2002, there was a ban against uh, gay gay marriage in, uh, that was implemented into our Nevada Constitution. That wasn't too long ago. Um, and now 70% 70, 70 of Americans support LGBTQ rights. And that's what we have in our favor, is that people have been starting to come out. People like, if you see on the slide, uh, David Parks is the first out politician that was elected in Nevada. And at first, people were telling him not to be himself. They were they were saying that he wasn't going to win, but he decided to become visible anyway. Another person that we have here is uh, Pat Spearman, who in, uh, just recently initiated or, or proposed a bill to ensure our right to vote. I'm thankful to her. And then uh, we have over here on the right, Nelson Araujo, who, who was a student uh, when I was a teaching, when I was offering these workshops for the Latino Community uh, Youth Leadership Co uh, Conference. And what I would do is I would offer this, this workshop called Gay Pasa, homophobia, homophobia in the Latino Community. And the reason I would offer that is that so often when I tried to, as an activist, join Latin, Latino Latinx groups, they would often exclude, they would often be sexist and they would often be homophobic. And I, was tell, I would try to explain to them, you know, you can't be 
uh, throwing us under the bus. We're here fighting alongside you. And so uh, when I was doing the, the youth conference, uh, the, Latin, the, the Latin Chamber of Commerce, which is the group that sponsors it, uh, was completely against uh, not only my workshop, but the Planned, Parent, uh, Planned Parenthood workshop. They felt that it didn't have anything to do with business. Well, the people who were organizing the event were felt absolutely betrayed and insisted that I go through uh, presenting my, my workshop, uh, which was called Gay Pasa. And so what they did is they put um, uh, tape over the mouth, uh, uh, duct tape over their mouths, and just funneled the students into uh, a program that was you know, supposed to be something else, but it was my program instead. So they basically defied uh, the the their their sponsors at their at that time. And Nelson Araujo was not out at that time, but he witnessed all of this. And then later on, he came out as a gay politician and served his community. So just talking about the importance of being out, being visible, and being out of the closet. Uh, go to the next slide. So what is our threat today? Our threat today is that Trump nominated an ultra conservative uh, judge, Amy Coney Barrett, who used to serve as a law clerk for Justice Scalia. Justice Scalia is known as being an originalist, someone who believes that the constitution should be interpreted the way that the founders wrote it. So the way that the law was written at the time should be the way that we interpret the law. Uh, the reason why this is is frightening is because, again, we can go back to this whole idea of, of the win that we just had on the basis of sex. Uh, did on the basis of, of sex mean uh, queer people as well? Clearly not when it was written. And so that so we can tell right away that, that this person is going to be somebody who's fighting against us. She, when, why, why is it that we know that she's going to be fighting against us? Uh, we know that uh, when uh, the 2015 gay marriage uh, law uh, was announced, she criticized uh, the people who defended it, even the conservative judge uh, Roberts who, who sided with us. Um, and uh, she argues that Title VII doesn't protect transgendered Americans, and she goes out of her way to talk about them as being physiological males and females. Next slide. So uh, when I was coming up with the uh, the, the slideshow, uh, she was being, it, it was at the very same time uh, that she was being, uh, uh, asked, being uh, interrogated about her positions, which she was very deftly uh, avoiding. And she was uh, t trying to say that she was uh, not going to, you know, people wanted to know, how are you gonna rule on gay marriage? Are you gonna set us back? And uh, because we, we know that there are two conservative justices, uh, uh, Clarence Thomas and Samuel Lito, who have, who have said that they wanted to overturn Obergefell. And that is the, the, the big gay marriage one. And so, and, and why, what's the, the basis on which they want to uh, contest it? It's on a state's rights. They want to make it so that we can go back to this patchwork where every state gets to determine whether or not uh, they are going to recognize gay marriage. And again, this is going to bring a host of problems, which you know uh, the Obergefell uh, decision had had fixed. I'll go to the next slide. So, what is it about states' rights? States' rights is a, a rallying call that was created in the South uh, as a, as a way because it wasn't okay to say, yeah, we want to return, you know, back to uh, slavery. Uh, so what they did, instead of saying, we want to return back to the conditions of slavery, they started saying things like states' rights. States' rights is what would have allowed the South to keep their slaves and let the North do what they wanted. So whenever people start invoking state rights, this is what we call a dog whistle. And so she uses a number of dog whistles uh, in her when she is speaking about gay rights. States' rights is one of them, and then in, the one that follows is another one. Uh, go to the next slide. So Diana Feinstein, and uh, before I start talking about Diana Feinstein, uh, you know, uh, talking uh, and asking uh, the Judge Barrett uh, questions, uh, I was just curious: does does, ever, does anyone know how Diane Feinstein got her start in politics? Does anybody know her connection to Harvey Milk? And if not, could you just go to the 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 the, the next slide for a second, just to contextualize this? 
So everyone knows that Senator Feinstein, Diane Feinstein, has been on the Senate for as long as anyone can remember. But I just wanted to point out that, you know, when Harvey Milk, the first gay, openly gay elected official, was assassinated by Dan White, that was the moment that Diane Feinstein became the mayor of San Francisco. So this so she was actually kind of like born in the fire. And so she has always been very, very supportive of queer rights. Please go back now to the previous slide, Robin. So she is very curious to see, you know, if uh, Amy uh, Coney Barrett is going to be like Scalia, a consistent vote to roll back hard fought freedoms and protections for the LGBT community. That's a, a quote. Um, and so Parrot responded and she was being very clear. And, and let me just say that this is not sloppy thinking. This isn't what the, that she was unprepared. She knew that these questions were coming. And so what she did is she used a, a, a sort of language that allowed her to deny, right, anything, but then yet at the same time confirm for her audience what they wanted to hear. So she says, I want to be clear that I have never discriminated anyone on the basis of sexual preference, and I would never discriminate on the basis of sexual preference. Notice that she says it twice. This is not by accident. This is a dog whistle. She's for people who are not uh, aware of dog whistles, who don't hear that particular frequency, it sounds like she's not going to discriminate against gays, but that's not the truth. And so said the Senator from Hawaii checked her and said sexual preference is an offensive term. It's outdated. It's used by anti uh, uh, LGBTQ activists to suggest that sexual orientation is a choice and it's not sexual orientation is a key part of a person's identity. Uh, so, while the senator was highlighting that for the audience who wasn't aware that she was using loaded language, what she was telling people who were anti-gay is, hey, I'm with you and I'm going to rule against the LGBT community whenever I can. Uh, next, sorry. Thank you. And so one of the things that I would say is uh, in learning about our history is a call to action is, is to be out, is, is to come out of the closet. And as simple as it may seem, uh, I know that when I came out, I came out in the 1990s, uh, it, and one of the rules that you learn right away is that you never come out once. You know, it's like this continual coming out, coming out to your friends, coming out to your, the people that you work with. Um, but if you don't come out, what is the risk? You risk invisibility. And this is one of the elements of oppression. It erases our history. It means that we don't exist. And so we don't have to uh, care for anything. Uh, go to the next slide uh, for a second. So yeah, so before before you know this uh, idea of you know that coming out never happens once, we need to uh, acknowledge that one of the elements of oppression is violence and the threat of violence. And the reason why people don't come out is they're afraid, and they're afraid from the very beginning. So let's just talk about the the the, the ways that we're afraid. We're afraid because we're afraid we're, our families are going to reject us. Uh, think about all the other isms that you have. You know, my mother is not going to reject me because she discovers that I'm female. My mother is not going to reject me because she discovers that I'm Latina. But uh, when she found out that I was queer, it did uh, create a strain on our relationship. And so this is what, what is so different about um, you know, the, the marginalization of queers, is that we have to actually risk the rejection of our own families so that we don't have any kind of su support. Uh, and so uh, I, I hear this uh, regularly from my English 272 uh, uh, students, uh, their fears of coming out, uh, that even when their parents are trying to protect them, uh, that by telling them to hide in the closet, they're, they're inadvertently telling them that there's something uh, that they have to hide. Next slide out. Next slide. Uh, and so, what, no, before that, uh, I just wanted to say uh, that this was part of the slide of just saying that, you know, well, a, as Joe was saying, that we've always been fighting alongside you. So when the feminist movement, the lesbians were there. When people were fighting, you know, race politics, we were there. And, and to not forget us, that while you are fighting for these other rights, don't put queer rights on the back burner. All right, that's it.
Oh, all right. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, so uh, before we go anywhere else and before anyone jumps out, I want to steal a quick moment here to um, plug CSN's Safe Zone program. So the Safe Zone program is something CSN does that you can be a part of to help promote this type of culture on campus. Um, and it is designed to promote a more welcoming, safe, and inclusive environment for members of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer LGBTQ communities, and to educate and promote understanding, appreciation, and respect. It includes training, the formation of an ally program with identified safe zones throughout the college campus, making information and resources available at various locations, including safe zone spaces, a safe zone web portal, and targeted events and activities. Training allows individuals to become acquainted with proper terminology, understand the challenges faced by LGBTQ plus students and staff, become well-versed on community resources, and learn to properly manage interactions with students who need assistance. Individuals who complete this training will be given an emblem that they can choose to display to identify them as allies. Given participants permission, your names and contact information can be added to the list of resources contained in the Safe Zone web portal, hosted by the Office of Community Relations, Diversity, and Multicultural Affairs. You will learn something in this training, even if you're familiar with the subject matter. I was surprised by how much it taught me. Um, and as a CSN ally, you will be included in the Safe Zone Canvas community for updates to community and campus resources, given op uh, the option of being identified by name on our program webpage and or in program materials, again, only if you want to, and sent the coveted Safe Zone ally emblem, which you may have seen around campus, not so much this semester, but in the past, um, that you can choose to display on your office door or window to identify yourself as an ally. The class is two sessions, and for more information, you can reach out to Joe Hassert. His email was earlier. It can be found you know, on his contact page, joseph.hassert at csn.edu. Um, or anybody here, I'm sure, will be able to point you in the right direction. Or you can check out the CAPE website where it's located. And I would also like to thank our panelists today for sharing their stories, their research, and most importantly, their time with us. I'd like to say that I'm absolutely honored to be a part of everything that you guys do for our committee and CSN as a whole. So um, now if we have any questions, I'd like to invite you to share them here so we can have the panels panelists go through and answer them. If there's anything, please feel free. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna stay on for a little bit longer even, so you know, if anyone wants to talk. So this is Robin, and we haven't had any questions in the chat, but we've had lots of sharing, um, lots of kudos, lots of comments. The last one was um, education is power. Never stop being proud of who you are, even if others don't agree. Um, so I'm not seeing any questions, uh, but ooh, we've got, can we get a copy of the slides? <laughs> you can absolutely get a copy of the slides. We'll go ahead and post it here, um, but we also have a running list of participants that we can email them out to. Uh, that's a really great question, Mackenzie, about Latinx or Latin. Uh, we're, we're starting to notice that Latin is being used in South in uh, Latin America, and that Latinx seems to be specifically be used in North America. If that helps. You know, there, there are such new words that uh, terms that have evolved that uh, it's interesting to see which one will will uh, persevere. You know, because uh, when I when I was younger, it was uh, the, the fight was about Chicano versus Mexican American. Patricia, could you speak a little to? Um, I've been reading a lot of stuff recently, specifically about the Latin and Latinx, and some of the criticism I've been reading is it seems to be that those outside of the community are more wedded and excited to the idea of Latinx and those in and part of the community um, aren't as thrilled about it. Oof. That, uh, I again, know, right? Yeah, yeah right. That's a, that's a I bomb. would say that, that is because it's a new term. Uh, we've been, okay. uh, so so one of the problems that I have, and I, and I, and I encounter this with uh, other people that I meet within my community, um, I'll have, uh, you can almost tell what people's political position is by the label that they choose. So, for example, if I meet uh, someone that looks like me and she identifies as Hispanic, I'm almost going to bet that she re votes Republican. 
uh, because Hispanic is not something that an academic would use. So it also has to do with education. Uh, Hispanic is, an, uh, is a messy term because it groups together people who are from Latin America and then Europeans from Spain, but then excludes Brazil, which is the largest, Latin America, largest country in Latin America. So you see that ha Hispanic only works when you're talking about people who speak Spanish, not all of Latin America or people that share that colonial rule, right? Uh, so then, uh, you know, so then growing up, uh, people started, you know, using the word Mexican American. And uh, I remember that uh, people were saying that they liked the hyphen the best because they felt like they were between two worlds. And so um, then you had the, the whole Chicano movement, right? And the Chicano movement was interesting because it was a politicized term, so not everybody used it. And again, uh, if you asked uh, most people who were immigrants if they identified as Chicanos, they would absolutely not, because again, they're speaking a different language, they're speaking Spanish, and they would have called those people pochos. Another term entirely. So it keeps going and going and going. Mm -hmm. And so right now what we're, we're saying is that in order to be respectful, you know, because we don't, uh, in, in English, it's easier to be uh, gender neutral than it is in Spanish. In Spanish, everything okay. has a gender. And so order, in order to be respectful of the pronouns, uh, more, the younger, more educated, uh, uh, you know, Latin, Latinx generation, is they've turned to Latinx. But that doesn't mean my mom knows it. I mean, if I told her what that that word said, she wouldn't have any idea what that. Meant. No, and 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 to be honest, the criticism and the critique that I was reading was squarely aimed at white liberalism uh, for using a term and trying to say this is the term that we all use now because it's the right term, uh, without it really understanding the nuances or or what the community wanted or how they wanted to represent. So I just thought it was kind of interesting. I was just wanting your thoughts on that. Well, and, I, and, and I'm glad that you mentioned it because uh, we talk about labels and that groups mm -hmm. need to choose their own labels rather than having them imposed on us. Absolutely. And, we, you know, we could talk about the, the fact that when I started, when I called the class queer literature, I was attacked by my, uh, my mm -hmm. friends. Uh, they were like, queer is a bad term, you know, and I was like, we're reclaiming it. In academia, we've been reclaiming it since the 1990s. Oh, yeah. and, and it's because we get so sick of, uh, you know, adding another letter to the acronym to the point that we get mm -hmm. like built bag. And so nobody really knows how, again, that, that the evolution of that term is constantly changing too. Mm -hmm. And so one of, that's one of the reasons that I, I kind of stick to queer. But Latinx, I think, it is probably going to, to win out, I, it's, I, I'm thinking. Or, or Latin, one of those two. If I could jump in for a second, I think we should stop the video recording before that file gets too big. Um, I'm definitely happy to hang out a little longer. Um.